So our study uh, takes the uh, channelopathy study to the next level. Uh, you know, the, the study of channelopathies have been mainly driven by uh, looking at patients who present and die suddenly and trying to dissect what happened. Uh, going to sort of the scene of the crime and working backwards from there. So you take a, an affected patient, you do a full structural uh, analysis, look at their arteries. When s those are all clean, then you go back and start to ask about family history and looking at how family history modifies the disease. And if you see a link in the family that, yes, there are patients who are, or family members who are dying suddenly, well, then that tells us there may be a genetic component. Then with that information, we can get to the, the molecule. Uh, so that's a backwards approach where we can identify how the molecule may be affecting the arrhythmic condition. Uh, then using mouse models and other you know, cell culture based systems, we can introduce those genes into mice and then see if they manifest the disease process. Uh, and that's how we've been traditionally doing things for years. Uh, the problem with that is, um, one, the heart is a very complex three-dimensional structure. And uh, not only is it this three-dimensional structure, but depending on whether it's a mouse heart or a human heart, the electrophysiology can be extremely different. Uh, if you were to show a mouse EKG to a cardiologist, you know, they wouldn't even understand you know, how to even categorize the general things that we would categorize on an EKG for a human heart. It's so different. Uh, where does you know, the activation begin and end and where does uh, what we call repolarization, resetting of the heart's electrical activity beginning and end. And those things are all sort of a, a nebulous thing in a mouse heart because it happens all at this, you know, pretty much on top of each other. And so, um, so with those electrical differences, uh, trying to take a human disease that's an electrical problem and then s put that on top of a mouse and say, well, now do we understand what's going on? And, and the big question, or, or the, the answers to come out of it are generally, it's given us some insights, but not enough. Not enough to really understand the disease. And so that's where the pig comes in. The pig gave us a great opportunity because you're taking an animal that is large. Uh, we understand the physiology because it's been studied historically uh, from the perspective of heart physiology for decades. And now with the ability to modify the gene of a pig, we can create a genetically modified pig that has the human mutation built into it and begin to then ask more sophisticated questions um, uh, and study the mutation in a system that looks much more like the human system. So if you look at a pig EKG, well, any cardiologist can read a pig EKG because it looks almost identical to human EKG. And that is really the power of the pig. You know, having an animal model, uh, and again, a, an animal model that really recapitulates uh, the human physiology, well, we can start challenging the pig, uh, not only getting the, the information like we did from our first publication, which is to show that it had a lot of elements of the human condition, where it had conduction disease, uh, it had increased sensitivity to certain drugs that block the sodium channel, which the pigs have a mutation in, uh, and uh, they had arrhythmias, very lethal arrhythmias that were uh, um, spontaneous within the the heart um, uh, the uh, the heart pump system that we have to study heart physiology, so it had a lot of elements of the human condition. So what that takes us to now is well deconstructing how and why these arrhythmias happen, and uh, begins to start to get to the questions of well, what makes it happen spontaneously in an intact system. So, um, like we said, you know, these arrhythmias can happen spontaneously and lead to death in, in patients. Well, there are certain things that um, we've learned from patients. For example, in the case of Brigada syndrome, uh, arrhythmias can happen when you know, you're sleeping or when you have a large meal or when um, you intake a lot of alcohol. So things that we call sort of vagal responses. Um, well, 
does that same thing happen in the pig? And so now we can go back to the pig and start challenging them in ways to see how much that can uh, provoke the arrhythmias in a large animal. We can do a lot more things uh, that can, you know, essentially, uh, uh, you know, get to the basis of the, the trigger for the arrhythmia uh, using these pig models. Uh, we also know that fevers, for example, can induce uh, uh, arrhythmias in people. So uh, how do fevers affect the uh, electrophysiology in the pig uh, with this mutation in it? So all of these things can now actually start to be studied. And hopefully, uh, you know, as we get more answers about how a single mutation can lead to such a, a lethal uh, event, uh, we can start now beginning to dissect uh, the, you know, the, the molecular pathways and the, and the effects on physiology uh, much more than we could ever do before.